the next level of analysis is, well, what's going to happen to interest rates? Everybody wants to know that. Um, in my view, they've peaked. Um, they're going to come down. Uh, and if you like that action, you might prefer the 10-year note because uh, a longer maturity has a higher, you know, not to get too technical, it's called DBO1, dollar value, one basis point. What it means is that so interest rates come down a certain amount, you know, 25 basis points, 50 basis points or whatever. And I said, bond prices go up, which they do. But how much do they go up? Well, the answer is the longer the maturity, the more they go up, they're more volatile. So the big question is, have rates peaked? And I would say they have. And I based that on what I said earlier about the economy. If we're going into a recession, we're going into a slowdown. We're looking at all kinds of geopolitical risks. Stocks are coming down. Then interest rates are going to come down too. The Federal Reserve appears set to maintain its primary interest rate without changes on Wednesday, even as the Fed confronts a resilient economy facing growing interest rates, international turbulence, and concerned investors. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell acknowledged recent signs of slowing inflation, but assured on Thursday that the central bank would remain steadfast in its commitment to the 2% mandate. During an eagerly anticipated address delivered at the Economic Club of New York, Powell refrained from endorsing a specific policy direction, but did not signal a leaning towards raising interest rates further. According to economist Jim Rickards, interest rates have likely reached their peak and are anticipated to decline within the bond market. As interest rates decrease, bond prices typically ascend, with the extent of price increase varying based on the bond's maturity. Bonds with longer maturities, such as the 10-year note, tend to exhibit more pronounced price fluctuations, rendering them more sensitive to interest rate movements. This relationship is a result of bond price sensitivity to interest rate shifts, known as the dollar value of one basis point, DV01. Longer-term bonds are inclined to exhibit greater volatility in response to interest rate adjustments. Since late July, the yield or interest rate on the 10-year U.S. Treasury note has surged from approximately 4% to about 4.8%, marking a 16-year high. This rise in yield has raised other borrowing costs and elevated the national average 30-year mortgage rate to 7.5%, according to Freddie Mac, representing a 23-year high. Jim observes that among U.S. Treasury securities, the most attractive yields are found in shorter-term securities, particularly six-month bills. This is atypical, given that longer-term bonds typically provide higher yields to compensate for the added risks associated with a lengthier investment horizon. In the current market, two-year notes offer a favorable yield with lower volatility compared to 10-year notes. This renders two-year notes an appealing choice for investors seeking security and a reasonable return. We will now showcase excerpts from Jim Rickard's conversation with Paradigm Press. However, before we proceed, if you desire more content like this, please click the subscribe button and activate the notification bell for additional updates. Thank you and enjoy the video. Right. So when we say bond markets, Matt, we have to be careful which bond market. I'm talking about the U.S. Treasury bond market. Um, you know, the short-term short treasuries, you know, four-month bills, six-month bills, up to one year. From, from zero to one year, they're called bills. From two years to 20 years, they're called notes. And the 30 years is called a bond. So if you're an expert, you say bills, notes, and bonds, but they're all treasury securities. But uh, so, so I just want to be specific. We're not talking about corporate bonds, just to be clear, because those mm -hmm. may... Uh, do very poorly if 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 a company is going to underperform, we're going to go into a recession. We're going to have a um, uh, you're going to see bankruptcies increase. So bond, those corporate bonds are going to get hammered, but uh, certainly junk bonds. But um, so we're talking about U.S. Treasuries. The funny thing now is that the highest yields in the U.S. Treasury market are in like a six month bill. Like, wait a second, you know, shouldn't shouldn't I get more if I buy a thirty year bond, or shouldn't I get more if I buy a ten year note? Um, it's a longer maturity, more stuff can happen, inflation, you know, credit downgrades to the United States, uh, you know, bank freezes, uh, all those things can happen. I want a higher interest rate for my longer term security. That's usually the way the yield curve looks. It's kind of goes, it's upward sloping, the longer the maturity, the higher the rate. That's not true today. The highest maturities are right around um, six month bills, one year bills, going out to two year notes. When you get to the 10-year note, um, you actually get a lower interest rate, lower what's called yield to maturity than you do on a two-year note. So uh, this the interesting thing about two years is you get a high rate 
uh, but it's less volatile than a 10-year note. Uh, it's more liquid. Um, and 10-year notes are pretty liquid, but, but two-year notes are very liquid. Um, so you can actually have the best of both worlds. You can have a shorter maturity, which means less risk in some ways, and a higher interest rate. So it's like, like I say, the best of both worlds. But the highest interest rate is actually from six months to one year. So those are very, very safe security securities. And they're paying like five and a quarter, you know, uh, not quite five and a half, but you know, well, between five and a quarter and five and a half percent for six months, for a six month treasury bill. Why wouldn't you just buy one of those? I mean, it's more than what you get in the bank. Now, the answer is, um, well, yeah, Jim, that sounds good. But if interest rates go up even more, you're going to lose money on, on your capital. The, the value of the note or bond will go down if interest rates go up. That's that's bond math 101. Your rates go up, prices go down. The opposite is true. Rates go down, prices go up. So you can make it lose money, but that inverse relationship kind of throws a lot of people, but that's just how it works. Um, so yeah, buying a two-year note that yields about 5.1%, very liquid, very safe, uh, good return, more than your bank will pay you, more than most stocks will pay you. Uh, why wouldn't you do that? Well, the answer is, if you think the two-year note is going to go to 6%, you might not like it because you're going to, you know, if you hold it for two years, you'll get your money back. But if you want to sell in the meantime, you're going to lose, you're going to have a capital loss. I think they're coming down from here on out. But uh, if you accept that view, then the 10-year note is going to have the biggest capital gains. Now, again, it's riskier. When I say risky, I'm talking about market risk. I'm not talking about credit risk. You are going to get your money back. But from a, but from a market risk point of view, if you had to sell it, you know, a year from now or six months from now, for that matter, uh, if rates go up, you're going to lose a little money on the, um, on the value of the note itself. But, uh, but if rates come down, not only do you get the 5% interest rate, which is sweet, but you're going to have a capital gain on the note because that's what happens when rates come down. So the big question is, have rates peaked? And I would say they have. And I based that on what I said earlier about the economy. If we're going into a recession, we're going into a slowdown. We're looking at all kinds of geopolitical risks. Stocks are coming down. Then interest rates are going to come down too. Uh, so, uh, so that's, so again, 10 year note is riskier. Uh, from a market point of view, not risky from a credit point of view, good yield and a lot of capital gains potential. Official data disclosed on Monday unveiled that the gross domestic product, GDP, expanded by 4.94% in the third quarter compared to a year ago, falling slightly short of the 5% median estimate from analysts surveyed by Bloomberg. Moreover, the economy displayed a modest growth rate of 1.6% in the prior three months, also slightly below the survey's estimated 1.67%. Jim, a specialist in economic analysis, envisions that the United States may be on the brink of a recession, despite the recent surge in GDP growth, reaching 5% in the third quarter of 2023. He underscores that this growth heavily relied on consumption and inventory accumulation. Recognizing that heightened consumption contributes to GDP, just as inventory accumulation does, nevertheless a crucial aspect to consider is the destiny of this surplus inventory. If it remains unsold, it ultimately results in markdowns and sales promotions to clear the excess stock, often occurring in retail stores to entice buyers. The inventory situation is intricately connected to consumer behavior. Significantly, consumer spending decelerated abruptly in August possibly attributed to the reduction in government-issued pandemic stimulus checks. During 2020 and 2021, both Trump and Biden rolled out stimulus checks totaling $1,400 and $600, alongside other relief measures. However, by 2023, savings had been depleted, with the savings rate plummeting from 13.3% to 3%. Many individuals resorted to credit cards, accumulating high-interest debt, Jim Rickard perceives this reliance on credit cards as a potential factor in an impending recession. Returning to the interview when contemplating the economic situation, Jim indicates, the U.S. may be entering a recession. People may wonder why, as just yesterday, GDP was up by 5%. However, this was heavily reliant on consumption and inventory growth. Inventory building counts as GDP but it becomes problematic when it doesn't get sold and has to be discounted or bundled to attract buyers. 
the consumer's behavior plays a significant role here. Notably, consumer spending suddenly slowed down in August after two strong months. Jim attributes this to the prior issuance of government stimulus checks, which created a temporary boost to savings and spending. However, by 2023, savings were depleted, and people turned to credit cards, accruing high-interest debt. In the near future, it is anticipated that the Federal Reserve will maintain its current interest rate, underscoring its commitment to a strong economy amidst rising interest rates and global uncertainties. What are your thoughts on this interview? Please share your insights in the comments section below. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more content like this. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like our video and subscribe for our channel.